what I'm going to do is present uh, my experience and, and I would say our experience from University of Washington and one of our uh, athletes who ultimately was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, share with you what we did in that experience and, and sort of open myself up to um, criticism or, or other from the panel um, to think about if what we did was actually the, the appropriate way to address this. Um, so I'll go through the, the, the case presentation and then really open it up to the panel for discussion and, and comments and additional um, uh, questions from the audience as well. So this was a, an 18-year-old uh, black African-American male college basketball player, uh, came in for their uh, PPE in, in September 2008, completely asymptomatic, negative family history, normal physical exam. Uh, this was a stud of an athlete, 6'7", 265 uh, pounds, really a, a athletic sort of uh, um, power forward, I would say, in, in basketball. Um, this was their screening ECG initially, and I know it might be hard for you to uh, see from the panel perspective here, um, but it did have uh, abnormal T-wave inversion in, in V4 and V5, uh, for which initiated some evaluation. So in our initial echo in September of 2008, uh, I'll just give you some of the measurements listed at the bottom. Uh, LV uh, end diastolic diameter was 4.9 centimeters. On this echo, um, the septum was 1.5 centimeters and the posterior wall uh, 1.6 centimeters and, and then a high EF of, of 77%. So this was 2008, take it, um, and I think uh, using cardiac MRI was still a little bit in its infancy in, in this setting, but um, thankfully we had a, a good uh, um, access and expertise at the University of Washington um, and we got a cardiac MRI in 2008. And, and a, a cardiac MRI, which provided more accurate information about uh, thickness, really revealed to us that some of our initial uh, echo measurements were perhaps falsely elevated or, or too high. And so the maximum wall thickness um, from our cardiac MRI was uh, 1.3 centimeters in the mid-septum. And then there was also this comment, um, small region, 13 millimeters of subendocardium delayed enhancement in the mid-apical, mid-septum, of uncertain significance, a component of which could be due to artifact. And at the time, we were looking at this with our imaging experts at the University of Washington. Again, I think uh, cardiac MRI and, and looking at late gadolinium enhancement was still young in terms of what we understood. We didn't exactly know what, what to make of um, that presence of, of LGE. But again, um, max wall thickness, 1.3 centimeters. We went on to do a, a cardiac stress perfusion study, thinking that maybe there was some type of ischemia that caused the LGE. There was no apparent wall motion abnormalities, no, no scan evidence of ischemia or prior infarction. Um, patient got a, a CPAT as well. Uh, VO2 max was 36.6 um, uh, kilo, kilograms, uh, um, 36.6, excuse me. Um, and so our initial recommendations, this was in 2008, um, that we had diagnosed basically mild concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, um, and the cardiac MRI provided a maximum wall thickness of 1.3, normal diastolic function, and the athlete was cleared to participate in sports uh, with, with close follow-up and serial evaluations. So this was uh, electrocardiogram one year later, um, still with uh, a TV inversion, perhaps a little bit greater. Uh, ECHO in 2009 actually showed better measurements than the year prior. Um, the septum of, of one centimeter, posterior wall one centimeter, um, a little bit more dilated, 5.5 centimeters. Um, in April of 2010, here's an ECG now showing um, pretty striking uh, T-wave inversion into those uh, lateral leads. We got another echocardiogram uh, where uh, the chamber uh, diameter is 5.3 centimeters, septum 1.2, posterior wall 1.2, so still pretty consistent what we had um, just prior to that. Then they came back in September 2010, preseason as a junior uh, to play college basketball, and now we just had sort of undeniable uh, striking and, and deep uh, T-wave inversion and uh, ST segment depression in the uh, lateral and, and really infralateral leads. And at this point, we decided to repeat the cardiac MRI. So just to show that comparison, I know, again, it's hard for the panel to see, but um, uh, you can see the um, ECG from 2008 compared to 2010 and just the uh, change over time. So 
so we repeated that cardiac MRI, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, instigate uh, some uh, videos here of the cardiac MRI. I will not interpret this for you, but uh, needless to say that um, there was uh, some asymmetric uh, hypertrophy that we were seeing uh, now in uh, two years after their initial ECG. So in terms of measurements, again, in September 2008, 12.8 uh, uh, millimeters was the max uh, thickness. Now in September 2010, two years later, uh, nearly 20 millimeter uh, thickness. So undeniable pathologic uh, hypertrophy um, based on this cardiac MRI. Again, just looking at the ECGs that correlated with that. Um, on the four-chamber view, with, uh, definitely showed some late gadolinium enhancement. I'll read what was uh, written in the report. 13 millimeter size, unchanged, delayed subendocardial enhancement at the mid-apical, mid-septum. This is what we saw two years prior. And a new 10 millimeter size region of subendocardial enhancement at the inferior apical region. And we've heard about um, uh, this study prior, that sometimes you see the ECG manifestations of a cardiomyopathy before the morphologic features. And so two years after their initial ECG, we made a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, midventricular or apical variant um, as, as described. Um, this was not a 30-second um, uh, conversation with the athlete, uh, coach, and family. This was more like a three-hour conversation uh, with the coach, family. Um, that, that went well beyond that in the weeks to follow. But ultimately, our, our recommendation was a disqualification or that he stop really playing competitive athletics. Um, we wanted to complete the risk stratification um, to see if he was uh, eligible for a, uh, or needed an implantable uh, cardioverter defibrillator. So we did get a Holter monitor, exercise treadmill test, um, and uh, recommended a, a family screen. Um, we also talked about uh, what we thought at the time. This was not um, a disqualification from all exercise. This is what we thought was a disqualification from um, D1 competitive basketball in what we knew at the time to be uh, emerging data on incidents as the highest risk group in a male black college basketball player. Um, and we tried to give them some safe exercise recommendations that well went well beyond uh, the 1A classification. Um, we got them a heart rate monitor to wear, based on a CPET, and sort of arbitrarily gave him a, a 140 beats per minute uh, cutoff, um, recommended cycling over running, et cetera. And again, this was not guideline-based, but more uh, gestalt-based and, and clinical experience-based. So I'll turn it over to the panel here, and, and my questions are this. Um, did we miss the diagnosis in 2008? Would you let him play? And how would you approach the participation decision process? with this athlete. And I'll open it up to any of you. Who wants to start? <coughs> well, coming from Europe, well, at least for the next two years, um, I should like to say that the European perspective that you heard from Mike comes from Italy. Yeah. It doesn't come from the United Kingdom. The two words that I dislike are mandate and disqualify. I don't think those two words should exist in sports cardiology. So I can tell you now that we wouldn't have disqualified this individual. Uh, well, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have just said disqualify. We would have certainly spoken to him about his diagnosis and his risk and clearly respected the autonomy before a decision was made. So that's the one thing I did want to say in response to the European recommendations. And I'm also pleased to say that I wasn't part of the recommendations that said that if you were gene positive, you were just automatically disqualified. And I would like to reassure all of you that we are following the same, in the same principles as the AHA and the ACC as we, um, we always lag behind the Americans, as you know, um, in, in, in our recommendations. Um, so we're, we're, we're sort of, we've got the same position, gene positive, phenotype negative, probably we find to compete. But yeah, I, I would have definitely, I'd been concerned. I don't know if you missed the diagnosis earlier, but the echo, uh, the echo data you provided with a septal thickness of 15 and a posterior wall thickness of 16 in someone who had an LV cavity of around 49 really made me think of pathological left ventricular hypertrophy. And I think the MRI sort of swayed us against, but then I was, interest, in, I was, I was interested that the GAD 
pattern was subendocardial, which I would expect is an ischemic pattern as opposed to a cardiomyopathic pattern. Uh, but of course, as things went on, I think the ECG told the story. And one thing I'd like to emphasize to all of you is that one, there's, there's one sporting discipline where the most basic test is the most useful test. And I don't think any test has been invented in cardiology that's superior to the ECG when it comes to sports cardiology. And I think the ECG told more of a story than the imaging did until very late on. Add that I'm glad you missed the diagnosis for two years because that kept two years before the rug got pulled out from under him. Right, so, um, I mean, I'm just joking a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, I would say even had we made the diagnosis in 2008 with it, I think shared decision making applies to this issue. One of the things that's quite interesting with the AHA ACC statement is the X being lifted for Task Force 10 in the channelopathies, if you read the cardiomyopathy task force section, which I also co-authored, it doesn't read like that. And the reason it doesn't read like that is not because the evidence is that much different, it's the drivers of the expert opinion. So this is, is um, as much personality driven and philosophy driven by the philosopher uh, of, of the various task forces. So in my approach to HCM, I follow a lot of athletes with HCM who are still athletes. And I think the same approach applies. I see it no different. In fact, the only difference is I feel far more comfortable with the athletes with HCM who have canonical sudden death risk factors that warranted them an ICD to stay an athlete than I do with the athlete with HCM who has a wall thickness of 18 to 21, 24 millimeters and no canonical risk factors and support them being an athlete, which I do, but I'm far more nervous about that person than I am the one with the 40 millimeter hypertroph who has his or her I ICD staying an athlete. I think the same process applies. I think the same counseling would, I think this African American would deserve to know about the risk taking behavior of basketball compared to him being a trackster or a different sport, that there is a relative risk that hits a high number. But a relative risk of 12 when your incidence of sudden death is still only one in 5,000 chance needs to be conveyed properly about relative risk increase and yet their absolute risk and everything. Um, maybe in a little bit I can share what we mandate, mandate uh, as the, the terms of agreement for us to be the supporter of their return to play. Yeah. But I, I want to hear from, from Aaron and Matt as well, but let me also say that if your risk is one in 5,000 in a general population of male basketball players, and you say maybe three per thousand have a disorder associated with sudden death, this guy's risk was not one in 5,000 anymore. It's one in 15. Uh, no. No. So I, I <laughs> so, so this is a perfect segue into what I was about to say, and that is I'm, I'm gonna encourage us to remove the term risk from this discussion, because risk is a quantifiable metric, and we cannot quantify risk accurately in these conditions. We're getting closer, but we're not there. So the term that we need to use with our patients and our families and their coaches and their trainers and their schools is uncertainty, not risk. Uncertainty is unquantifiable. Risk has to be quantifiable. We're not there yet. So these discussions are really challenging. But one of the ways to do this is to start giving people some examples of things that we can quantify from a risk perspective. What is your risk of getting killed in a motor vehicle accident? What is your risk of getting killed in a motorcycle accident? We have statistics for those. Those are well vetted. And we can start making some comparisons. And this oftentimes <coughs> helps people put this into a context that they can start to digest. But be careful with the term risk because we don't have the numbers. No, and I agree completely that we don't have the numbers. And I mean, Mike's been very lucky in that he hasn't had an event in this 615 person years. We have, we've had several. And I think it really cements you to the ground when you do get an event from someone who you knew was at risk, although you couldn't quantify it, and you, you allowed autonomy to, you know, you, you allowed them their autonomy and then they dropped dead. And you know the widow and you know the children. And you know, the whole department goes into mourning for about three months 
when something like this happens. So I do want to show you the other side that, you know, as although we are the ambassadors for, for our patients and we do give them autonomy, when, when you do get a bad, re when, when you do get a bad result, it really flattens the department for quite a while. Matt? So I don't think you missed the diagnosis in 2008 <clears throat> that the ventricle being smaller is concerning, and that's what I wrote down, the 15 millimeters with 49 millimeters, uh, the 49 millimeter dilated cavity or normal size, but it's really the small cavity, right? It's not a, that's 49, it's not small, it's the smaller cavity that would, would have made me nervous about that. I would have let him play in 2008, and I would have slept well. I didn't see the LGE, it's easy to say on this side, but at that little puny piece, it's not dichotomous anymore, right? So just having a little bit of LGE is different than having a whole lot of LGE. So the more scar, the worse the outcome. And so for me, we've already talked about return to play and, and all that, I, I won't belabor that, but I wanna make sure that it underscores two things. One, this is a, three things. One, this is a fabulous case of gray zone, right? You couldn't have picked a better one. I know that was by design. Uh, right smack in the middle of why Dr. Bagish said to me, Martinez, you seem to be aging like milk rather than fine wine. And uh, <laughs> I think that's really the cause. He didn't actually say that. I just like giving him grief. The, uh, but the, 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 the ECG T wave inversion, right, is something that needs to be followed. We've talked about it, that you can't just let it go. And we have, there's a number of professional athletes that are participating in sports right now with that ECG that a number of us are following. That we're, that uh, part of, I think, what Mike's gonna describe is the, the relationship I have with those individuals is that we, we come up with, a, with an agreement that we're gonna, we're gonna allow you to play because you're in this gray zone and we've built a case that we're not sure where you are. The ventricle is suspicious. It's a 13 millimeter thick, but the, diast the diastology is normal but you have to come back in a year to get reevaluated in order to go any further. Uh, that's the, the, the first thing. And the second is all of the discussion about the athlete, I think, has to go into this. What sport are they playing? Are they African American or not? Are they male or not? And then uh, I always call the trainers. I want to know about the EAP. I want to know about the defibrillator plan. I want to know how well, how well serviced that facility is to get, a, to get an idea because there is no better screening tool than than handling the defibrillator on the other side. If I, I'm gonna just comment one thing and challenge the panel a little bit more, and Aaron, you can, you can pop in here as well, but um, part of what has come up in this discussion has, has, bothered, has bothered me for a long time in terms of how we manage athletes that are diagnosed with, with HCM with a lot of uncertainty. And I think, Mike, you would agree that while shared decision-making um, is, is, is a great direction to go, we can flavor our recommendations in that shared decision-making process as we sort of counsel the family, one sort of swaying one way or the other, perhaps. And, and we have now some, some studies for long QT, for CPVT, where we feel more comfortable letting them play because we have data. We have the opposite for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, where, where no one would argue that continued intensive sports causes disease progression and clearly puts them at risk for ventricular arrhythmias. And then we have HCM that's somewhere in the middle. And we take a diagnosis of HCM and we do some risk stratification and if they have these super high risk features, they get an ICD and then in that athlete with the most high risk risk factors for HCM, we allow them to go back to play. And then if they have these sort of you know mild morphologic features, but clearly the disease, but aren't protected by an ICD, perhaps that's the one that we are recommending that they consider stop playing competitive sports. And, and, or, or perhaps that they walk around with an AED everywhere. And it's really, it, I'm not sure there's a right answer, but it, it clearly, you know, we're, we're, we've started to recognize and detect these athletes quite a bit more. And this is an area where I think when we have this specific case where we ended up in 2010 with sort of mild morphologic features of HCM in a, in a in a competitive athlete, what do we do with that now? Yeah, and I, but I do think there's a couple things that we have to be careful with HCM specifically. There is observational data emerging. Charlene Day has published quite an extensive experience of athletes with HCM. Uh, the event rate is extremely low. Obviously, we have the experience with athletes with defibrillators, and again, I'm going to kick that one out of the conversation because in this room, we're more comfortable. But there's a lot of cardiologists 
that the presence of a defibrillator, no matter why you got the defibrillator, no matter what disease you got it for, is disqualifying. So I'm not sure we hold the majority position yet about the presence of an ICD freeing you up to do whatever sport you want to do. Uh, I embrace that. Not, I'm not anything you want to do, but uh, I think autonomy is autonomy. The one thing that we've observed uh, is with the hypertroph and the ICD issue and a very slippery slope that we're already seeing people slide down, and that is you don't meet canonical risk factors for, your disease isn't calling for an ICD prophylactically from a canonical risk factor assessment, but I won't, get, I won't allow you to return to play unless you get an ICD. In other words, the ICD as being a sports enabler for the hypertroph with an 18 millimeter wall thickness. That's a pretty dangerous slippery slope because we will be paying the piper for ICD complications and baggage if we start viewing, and I see this in long QT by long QT people who shouldn't be long QT people, where they say, I don't think your disease needs a defibrillator, but you want to do a sport, so the only way I'm going to sign your paper is for us to install a defibrillator, and then I'll free you to play what you want to play, and I think that's a very uh, bad way of practicing medicine in this space. One word to describe it, malpractice. Yeah. That's it. No, it. Putting a defibrillator into an athlete to allow athletic competition when they don't meet risk factors for that defibrillator and thereby relegating them potentially to a life of device-mediated complications is absolutely inappropriate. You know, John, one of the things you brought up with HCM, which is not really confined to HCM, there are other diseases, and another good one is the aortopathies, mm -hmm. where an athlete can be deemed potentially too sick to play but not yet sick enough to intervene and do something for and therefore mitigate risk. Those are the most challenging situations we have, and that's where shared decision making is absolutely the only appropriate way to deal with this. Now, Mike talked a little bit about the art of medicine and how the art of medicine should probably not play into consensus recommendations, but shared decision making is all about the art of medicine. And this is where we're kidding ourselves if we don't think we're flavoring the discussion. But what we have to do is make certain that we're transparent about where our flavor comes from. And this is really hard and it takes a lot of practice. And the one thing I'll say about this is that these are never one-time discussions. An athlete, a parent, a family, a school can never, even if they're the most savvy group of individuals, process this information and make a decision one way or another effectively in one setting. So I think we're kidding ourselves if we think even if we spend three hours with them that it's a one and done situation. There always has to be a follow up or two or three or four in re relatively short order. Yeah. The other thing I'll add to that is making sure that all the players are, are, are involved in the discussion. That uh, I, want to, I want to talk to their wife or their spouse or, and, and sort of have a better sense of who they are in total. And, and where they're from and what, what, the, what the oxygen is that they're trying to sort out that you, you mentioned earlier. I, I think yeah. that's part of the, that discussion. And if I could quick, just in case we run out, there are, I want to give you the, the, at least the four guidelines that we follow, the rules for return to sport that, that I make them agree to. The first is, this is really with minor athletes and their, their parents is, the family unit has to be in complete agreement. So we tell them, any one of the three of you can veto this decision, and one veto disqualifies that family unit. Because the one thing you cannot have, is you cannot have son and mother approve and father veto and then let them play, which is, that's actually a, never the scenario. It's always the father who's like, what's the big deal? You know, and it's the mother who is envisioning right in front of you the funeral that she sent her son to by letting him keep doing what he loves doing. That's what the mother is processing. So the family structure has to be three for three in one accord. Because if there is a tragedy and the mother and father were not on the same page, you will have two tragedies. The death of that athlete and that marriage will not survive. No way. So there has to be three for three agreement. The second is, once we make an agreement, um, is that there can be no covert operation. In other words, that athlete must communicate to the appropriate team officials, school officials, university officials, trainer, whoever, of presence of said disease and safety plan. You can't run the risk of the first time the team physician discovers the presence of this disease is because he collapsed on the court. And then you tell them, while I'm facilitating your return to play, 
the university may or may not be beholden to that conclusion. And they may choose in their autonomy to kick your son or daughter out. And we may not be able to overturn that. Just so you know that this could be the cascade reaction. Third is that you must agree to our treatment program to a T. And if we catch and learn of behavior like noncompliance, I'll be the first to call the coach to disqualify you. So what's interesting with that is our event rate in our long QT athletes is lower than our non-athletes. I've always speculated that's because we have an incredibly motivated collection of patients and athletes who want to follow the plan because they don't want to risk losing what they love doing. And then the last thing is the safety drill. The safety drill is really straightforward. And that is, if the athlete were to collapse and not regain consciousness within 10 seconds, 911 is activated, CPR is started, and that athlete's AED, not the school's AED, not the one hanging somewhere, somewhere, but every athlete who we return to play must have his or her own AED as part of their own sports safety gear, no different than the athlete with a life-threatening peanut allergy has his or her own EpiPen. They're not wondering where the school EpiPen is hanging. They have theirs in their sport bag. And that, that AED gets applied, shock delivered if instructed to do so. And thankfully, like you said, we have actually never had the AED, AED drill exercise in a single athlete in these 17 plus years. And it's gonna happen, will it happen? Yep, it's gonna happen. Will the AED work? We hope so, but we even document that this return to play could result in the death of your child for which even a rapidly applied AED could fail to rescue. You need to document this as the, as the shared decision-making side of the physician that you talked about all of those issues so that nobody could come back and say, you actually didn't inform this individual and this family structure well enough. And had you done it well enough, they would have disqualified themselves. So you need to have a very robust paragraph in the medical record about, your, about the participation drill. Let's take these uh, two comments or questions from the audience. Uh, I and have then a question, we'll but uh, end up. would that be a level three or a level four visit that you're referring to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, what do you say to the patients uh, when they ask you, well, what's the risk? And I know you can't quote numbers and you talk about uncertainty, but they are persistent. They say, well, is this an 80% risk, a 5% risk? Give me a ballpark is what they ask. So how do you deal with that? How do you dodge that or do you give them some sort of ballpark? So I can tell you <clears throat> the terminology that I'm fond of using if this applies, and that is that the risk is small, unquantifiable, but not necessarily prohibitive. And that's about as definitive as I get with people. I, I do try to put some numbers to it because I think people react to quantitative words easier than they do qualitative words. Um, so that's why I react and say there's no way this athlete's is a one in 15 chance because if, if you have a hypertroph with no canonical risk factors for sudden death, we can reasonably quantitate that that patient's risk is sub 1% chance per year. I think the evidence is good. Now, does blackness raise that number? Does basketball blackness raise that number? Uh, does it during division one? Yes, it does. Let's spot them that, that the catecholamine experience of that moves you from a sub 1% chance per year to a higher number. But there's no way it moves you to a 6, 7, 8% chance per year. Yeah, I mean, this is a personal preference thing in terms of whether you choose to give a number that you're almost certain is inaccurate versus not giving a number. And I don't know if there's a right yeah. answer to that, but I struggle with that. Yeah. So the, the other caveat I'll say, Mike, uh, is that uh, I've learned this the hard way, that a lot of times you quantify a number that you think is reasonable, <coughs> intermediate, or, or, or even high at 5%, and the patient view of that is, so you mean 95% of the time nothing happens? That's pretty good. Yeah. Right. So I, is I, good. I, right, but I sort of burned myself on this, trying yeah. to imply that you're in a higher risk category, just so that we can provide informed consent. And I've gotten run over, so I stop giving the percents. Uh, the, again, I, I'm not sure I'm right, but th that's how I do it. 
Thank you very much. It's a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I'm Michelle Eckhardt, cardiologist from uh, San Francisco. I'd like to uh, perhaps challenge or, or put a little nuance to the concept of shared decision-making. Decision it's very popular, it's very attractive, but in reality, a decision is made by one person, one will, it's one decision. The concept of decision-making is, I think, fundamentally flawed. When patients come to us, they want us to make the decision for them. It's really a delegation. They're delegating to us the decision to make. So we have to put ourselves in, our, in their shoes. So it's very important that we understand how important the sport is for them and so forth. But ultimately, it's our decision. So it shouldn't be that it's, the, the dichotomy should not be between complete autonomy versus authoritarianism, right? Authoritarianism is wrong. And when we're authoritarian, it means we're after our own self-interest or maybe after the interest of, you know, defending the interest of the team or what, and that's wrong. We really have to make the decision for the patient, but it's our decision. And, and if you, you know, push the decision onto the patient, then you invite problems that I think you mentioned about potential conflicts within the family. You know, if, what if, you know, the, the, the dad thinks one way, the mom thinks one way and so forth. So really, I think we have to make it clear that it's our recommendation, that it's ultimately our decision. Um, and you know, they're free, they're free to, to, to take it or to not, to find another doctor if they really are not going to follow it. But I think it, it adds clarity if we recognize that it's really the decision of the doctor on behalf of the patient, really trying to on, do the best we can to, 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 um, to fulfill the best interests of the patient. But thank you yeah, very I, much. I like a lot of what you said, and I, I'm not, I don't know that I disagree, but I guess here's where I disagree, is um, the hour I view is it's not my decision for that athlete. I really try to truly make it our decision with the hour being all of the parties in the room. And the one thing that, that I've come to see over the years with these families is nobody knows more clearly than the potential implication of staying in the sport that my child loves than the mother. That is heavy stuff. And they understand it. You can see it in their body language. You can see what she is envisioning. And not, not, it's not as if us dads don't ever do that. Sometimes we do. But it, it, the, you can see this visceral reaction in what the mother is processing and contemplating about the notion. And so it really is our in the sense of you're trying to understand where the athlete is in his risk tolerance appetite, where the mother and the father are, what we've communicated and how well we've communicated that we've mitigated that vulnerability as best we can. And even if we have residual uncertainty, how safe is our safety net strategy of an AED rescue? And then you process all of that and you see where they are. And we virtually never sign the papers on that first visit. We tell them to go home, talk about it, think about this, digest it. And where that athlete was on that initial visit, of, of course, sign me up, get me back in the game. Sometimes they're the ones two weeks later who said, you know, I've just put this through and I've stirred it around for a while. I don't think I want to do this anymore. And then that becomes our decision that we've mutually have come to. So I, I really don't think it's my decision. In fact, when they ask us, and they will ask you, if this was your child, what would you do, Dr. Ackerman? What would you do, Dr. Baggins? I always postpone that one. I tell them, I will answer that for you now, but not now. I want to understand where you are yet, because where I am about my appetite depends on my assessment of what would be viewed as oxygen for my sons or my daughter. And where I am in that scale may be different than when you were your family. So it doesn't really matter where I am. Then after all of this, I tell them where I would be with the, my comfortableness of doing exactly what they've chosen to do if this were my own son or daughter in this same situation. But I, don't, I think it's unfair to start with that answer because then it became our decision. Because if your answer was, nope, I won't let my son do that, then you have steered the outcome right away. John, I just, I, there's one thing I just want to say quickly, and, that is, and this is a shift of gears, but I think it's really important that we address something that you did with your patient 
which actually probably represents the most important, important step in all of this, and that is that when patients with any form of cardiovascular disease come to us, whether we disqualify them or they run their course and they stop playing competitive athletics and leave the rest of their lives, if we don't help them transition into a life that involves physical activity, they don't die from their genetic heart disease, they die from acquired heart disease, which is a function of unhealthy living and sedentary living. So what you did, no, I don't think anyone here would question your decision to exclude that athlete. You, you felt the, del the data was compelling, but the most important thing you did is enable this person to be healthy and active after they transitioned out of competitive basketball. Mm -hmm. And that is probably, as clinicians, probably the most fundamentally important thing we can do for our patients when they stop playing sports is transition them into a life of health. I'm going to uh, uh, just, I want to recognize the time for everyone. This is such a good discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to really cut it off. We're going we're gonna to end with the two final uh, questions or comments with, with David and Joe. Um, and I know we're running over, but I'm willing to stay. Um, so we'll just continue with that. Uh, great. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank you very much for leading this uh, ch uh, sort of wholesale change in the way we view this, because I think it's dramatic and uh, much needed. Um, so I have a couple comments and then one question for you guys. The first is uh, some follow-up on the EKG portion of things. I think Dr. Sharma's not gonna be very surprised, but it was shocking to me over the first year to see those T waves almost normalize uh, when he was uh, deconditioned, um, but they didn't see LV mass regression on the echocardiogram. So a lot of those changes in there were actually training or may have been training related in some way, shape or form in a part that did have some underlying cardiomyopathic, uh, cardiomyopathic um, conditions. I also think my second comment is this, and, and, and I think we're um, fooling ourselves a little bit or uh, patting ourselves on the back when we disqualify somebody and we think that they're reducing their risk because that athlete, um, there's something about those athletes who um, sport is so ingrained in what they do that they're not competing uh, for the team anymore, but I can almost guarantee you they're out there playing pickup basketball with their friends uh, multiple days per week um, if we disqualify them. The third, the third question I had is this. Um, you know, we, we deal at the college level with a lot of athletes who are uh, very competitive and have a lot of professional dreams. Um, every, you know, the, the, there's only a small minority of those individuals who go on to have professional careers and make money doing what they love. Um, in this particular case and other cases I've come across, we're dealing with, with uh, um, sudden cardiac death risk, number one. Um, but at least for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and the channelopathies may be a little bit different, it also impacts their peak functional uh, ability, their, their ability to exercise. And so this individual here um, had a peak VO2, I think, in the mid-30s, something like that. And, and I think the chances of him having a very successful professional career based on that peak VO2 are somewhat limited. I'm wondering if you guys ever incorporate some of that information into the discussion that you guys have with them. Um, and whether or not uh, you know, they think that your functional capacity is limited by your heart and you may or may not be able to play professionally because of it. Well, I think relating to the functional capacity story, I, I normally find if you put a basketball player onto a treadmill, get you, you'll get a suboptimal peak VO2. Yeah. Uh, these start-stop sports, we cannot really use the VO2 that we get from that on, on, on a Bruce protocol, for example. So I don't think I'd use the VO2 to decide whether someone's going to be able to play or not. We've got some very high-level football players, or soccer players, shall I say, uh, that have VO2s that are less than 100% predicted, yet they're amazing football yeah. players. And also, we should not be fooled into thinking that endurance athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have incredibly robust VO2s. There's a, there's a myth that having this disease relegates you to a subpar VO2. I take care of many, many very, very fit endurance athletes with HCM that present with VO2s in the 50 to 70 range. Do you, do you find that, it, so do you, do you find, because I have the same experience, that many of them can run and run better than my non-hypertroph patients can. Do you find that if you stop them, though, they have more trouble getting back on the horse? So I'm, I'm a little concerned whenever I hear about just six weeks or eight weeks or two months, three months of, of holding off, that it will be harder for them to get back to where they were before. Have you seen that, where it's harder to get back to that level? Because I have a lot of the hypertrophs who exercise and do well, and then they're told to stop exercising and then they have trouble getting back to that level. Have you seen it? No, I mean, I, I, it, it was me that shot myself in the foot by using that figure of 50 mils uh, per kilogram per minute or more than 120% predicted. You know, one of the great things about science is that you do something and then you end up proving yourself wrong 15 years later. And uh, I've had to eat humble pie ever since and that, keeps get throw, get, that figure keeps getting thrown in my okay. face. Uh, clearly, I hadn't really seen true 
sporty hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients when we wrote that paper. But in our experience, about 25% of athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy achieve supranormal peak oxygen consumption values. So final comment or question from, from Joe here. I think what's uh, pertinent to the conversation also is that um, many of the people who have HCM, if they're athletes or not, their sudden death doesn't occur during exercise. And uh, so uh, how do you deal with that? And uh, so that's just part of the general discussion, but it isn't just about the sports. We're finding that 80% of our HCM patients die at rest, yeah. which, you know, we haven't actually written that up, but uh, that's what we're finding. We could go on and on on this discussion. I, I think I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I won't comment further. Um, this has been a wonderful day. Thank you very much for, for spending this time with us.